I'll do. Attention, please, everybody. This is going to be about migrating a legacy product to Pyramid. And my clicker's not working, so we'll have to do it the old-fashioned way. Right, I'm Tom Blockley. I work for Delib. I've been a developer in Plone for just over five years now. I've been to all of the Plone conferences in that time. This is my first time talking, though, so go easy on me. All right. Uh, I've also been, to, been to, uh, doing Pyramid now for about two years and Scrum Mastering for about 18 months. Before that, for my sins, I was a Java developer. So, uh, Who are Delib with a other Plone company in Bristol that's not NetSite. Uh, you might know us as Team Rubber, but Delib is the part of it that does Plone. Uh, we've been going for quite a long time now, over 10 years, 12 years now. Uh, we do consultation solutions for government, uh, Plone has been a part of that for over eight years. Uh, we were the first to use Dexterity in a production site. That was before I even started, about six years ago. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, bleeding edge. It was a desperate act. Um, <laughs> and yeah, we've got three main products, two of which are based on Plone, one of which isn't based on Plone. That's the one we're migrating. We've got a lot of clients. I'm going to rush through some of this because we've got quite a bit to get through and I don't want anybody to miss their lightning talks. Uh, we've dealt with quite high volume stuff in the past. Uh, over 47,000 registered users on a Plone site with 110,000 contributors in three months. So I'm going to be talking about this stuff. Taking an old product to the Pyramid Framework, the choices we made about that, problems we had, how we did it in an agile way, uh, we set out to translate it right from the start and trying to do test-driven development and theming it. That will be the Diazo bit. So it's been around since 2005, this product, Budget Simulator. It's written in the ZMI with cubes. So you can imagine that's uh, a really joyous thing to work on. And it's completely customizable. That's one of the reasons why it was in the ZMI in the first place. And it's one of the strengths of the ZMI. You can actually customize stuff on a per-client basis as long as they don't mind not getting any updates to the product, not that there have been any updates for the product. 60-odd uh, clients, and it's ugly. It's really ugly. It's that ugly. It's brown. <laughs> All right? That's what it looks like. And that's what it's looked like since about 2005. It hasn't really changed. So as you can imagine, it was about time to bring that up to date a little bit. So. In May this year, we decided that we'd completely rewrite it from the bottom up. We chose that we would do that in Pyramid. And there were a few musts. It has to be pretty, as opposed to ugly. It has to be responsive, so it has to work on mobiles and tablets and PCs all the same. Uh, it's got to be accessible, because we, work, we sell this stuff to government clients, so everything's got to be uh, at least AA, sometimes AAA, or WCAG if you're American. Uh, it's got to be translatable, because we want to sell it to the global market. And it's got to be customizable. We want to minimize that customization by making it as good as we can. But clients kind of expect it by now. They want to be able to say, all right, I want to change where this is. I want to do this. I want to ask different questions. And we wanted it to be fully tested. Oh, and it had to be done by the start of this month, which was an arbitrary deadline, which we set for ourselves, which was, well, I say we. The boss set for us, which is perhaps not. <laughs> we didn't agree. Um, so we decided that we'd use a lot of stuff that we already knew how to use. We use Pyramid. We'll back it with a ZODB. We use Buildout for it. Some people don't like Buildout. We like Buildout. Uh, Diazo for the theming, which is a move over from Deliverance, which we've been using previously. Uh, Colander and Deform for the schemas and the forms and repose.workflow so that we can have some of the stuff that you get for free with Plone. Um, and Pyramid auth, because it's easy. We don't want to write our own. We don't want to use something else. And obviously, i18m for translation. So we decided this in May. We didn't start till July. So we had 10 weeks. And we did those separated up into 10 sprints of a week. And we tried to prototype stuff sort of 20 minutes, half an hour to throw together a page so that we can decide whether it works and throw it away afterwards. It's also worth noting that through each of those sprints, we had maybe two developers working at a time. So there wasn't enough. We had two other products to develop and client needs. So 
it, was, it almost took a back seat for the first half of those 10 weeks. We had an intern working on it for most of it, in fact, uh, which, is, which I'll get to later. Um, yeah, there's still a lot to do. It's not finished. The public end is pretty much done. So I'm going to just go very quickly through what happened in each of the sprints, because I said this would be about Agile as well. as just Pyramid. So we started off, it looked like that. We had a back end, which you couldn't log into. It looks like you're logged in, but you're not. There's no authentication there. And a front end, and it all looks pretty rubbish. It's all flat HTML. 48% uh, test coverage, so you know, setting out to be test-driven development, we did really, really well. 48%, pretty good, right? No, not so good. It was basically a hello world with a lot of prototype code. Number two, oh, sprint two, we, we named all of our sprints after people that we respected. That's, that was the idea. So we started at A, we were going to work through the alphabet. We haven't finished yet. Um, it's getting a bit bigger. We've got bootstrap in for the admin system. And we made a decision that we wanted to keep the styling on the admin system completely separate from the front end. Um, we didn't to start with, actually. We failed at that. Uh, <laughs> we decided that a little bit later. We upped the test coverage, though, so that's good. Charlie Chaplin, the third one, we didn't really have anyone working on it. We had our boss, who, was, who decided to make the stars a little bit shinier in the admin end. And we had an intern who, I don't know, moved a few things around, got annoyed with deform, and re-implemented some templates, I think. Um, number four, Don McCullen. We got a real developer. We did a lot of refactoring. <laughs> we upped the test coverage again. And nothing really changed, because we spent a week correcting, course correction, we'll call it, shall we? Edwin Hubble. Now we get, we did an actual front end. We stripped out all the nasties. We've actually got, I mean, it doesn't look like a budget simulator. It doesn't look like what you just saw, does it? But, and it doesn't really work. You can't respond. But you can see some information. It's, it's nice. It's a proof of concept. Um, and Matt, who's sat right there, managed to turn the tests. Uh, again, in turn wrote the tests to actually fire up uh, Selenium in a browser window to run all the tests for you, which was very nice. But he, Matt brought them down to 10 seconds rather than three minutes, which, as you can imagine, made increasing the test coverage a lot easier. Francis Crick. We've, again, made quite a bit of an improvement. Now you can respond. That's good. You can store all the information. Um, you've got consequences, which I'll come to later. Um, we included less in for our CSS compilation. We decided we'd go with that, because let's face it, who wants to write 1,000, 2,000 lines of CSS? And it all gets very confused. Grace Hopper, we're getting into it now. First time we have auth. Now you can log in. It's great. Pyramid's auth is really, really straightforward, and the group finder is very basic. You can do really, really, really simple stuff with it, or you can do a little bit of time and slowly plug bits in when you need them. Like, for example, we have two hard-coded users at the moment. We don't need any more yet. Um, and we put quite a bit of fine-grained control in, because we, we realized even at this point that quite a few things weren't going to get done in time for the administrators who were going to be logging in for the clients, so we took out demographics and appearance. Uh, for the normal client admin, for so the lib admin, we have that. That was achieved by putting uh, a wrapper around the standard has permission machinery into the render globals factory so that we could call has permission on templates. That worked out really nicely. Then we got a skin. Our front end designer finished building the HTML for that. And we spent, I don't know, a couple of days writing the Diazo theme rules for that. The sliders didn't work because there was a problem with JavaScript. Um, and we took a step backwards in terms of storing responses because the sliders didn't work. So there was no point putting a form behind it. And we went back to not being able to store responses. So we're, we're moving forward. Oh, yeah. At this point, we're almost all the way through. We're almost at launch date. Um, so we started naming our milestones not after people who we respected, but people who were getting good at you know, getting out of tight situations. Um, <laughs> Indiana Jones, right. This was the last week. On the Thursday of this week, we, we had to go in and have our launch event. We were demon demonstrating it to 
people who might be buying it off us and to people who we respected in the community. So as you can imagine, we, we spent an hour or so frantically deciding what we didn't have to finish and what we could just turn off. So we turned off the admin. We didn't demo that. That was an easy win. We got the sliders fixed. That all worked. A nice little, oh, we got responsive as well. That was what it looked like on an iPhone. It only worked on an iPhone or an iPad or a Mac. We didn't, it didn't work on any of the other browsers. I've got an S2, didn't work on that, not even slightly, still doesn't. Um, <laughs> but it will, it will by the time we go live to our first client at the end of October. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good start. We, we, we were happy with how the launch went and we started drinking and worrying about what a mess we'd left ourselves to get to here so quickly. And then the last work I did on it before flying out here, we got workflow for everything. So respondents now had a proper workflow so they couldn't go back and change all their response after they'd submitted it and administrators couldn't see it until they'd submitted it. And you could open and close the simulator itself so that you know when you roll it out, you don't want people to just stumble across it and fill in your survey before you finish setting it up, all that sort of stuff. I'll come back to that. Uh, later. So that's how we got by in 10 weeks to get to where we are now. So I'll talk a little bit about what we used. We combined Traverse and Dispatch. So a little bit of URL dispatch so you can have your, your nice pretty URLs, but you've got the traversal side of it as well, so you don't have to uh, do something like this and have a view configuration and a view thing callable and something like this which you call to get the context that you're trying to do stuff on. This was perhaps not the best way to do it but it was the, the way we did it to start with. We got rid of that and ended up with something that looked a lot nicer we also moved our view configs into the sensible place, which is above your view callables. Um, and you can, you can play with traversal nicely. It means that you don't have to, uh, you don't actually have to sacrifice your URL structures to use traversal. You can just combine the routing and the, and the traversal. I already talked a little bit about the authentication and using, putting your ACL on your models, on your model classes, uh, means that you can, you, you, you know where things are. It's dead easy to find it. You're not searching through hundreds of places looking for that, that thing that's hiding there. That's, this is our two hard-coded users and our group finder. Perfect implementation, I'm sure you'll all agree. Oh, the, the passwords and usernames are hard-coded in the login form as well. I shan't tell you what they are. They won't be, they won't be when we're finished. I just, I just should point that out, shouldn't I? Um, <laughs> we had a lot of fun with predicates. This is one of the things that we really like about Pyramid. You can do a lot of stuff with them. You can separate your form processing logic from a lot of the other form stuff by passing in, by you know, setting request parameter predicates. You can prefix roots if you're including configuration conf uh, view configs from different files or folder structures. You can add the prefix to when you're including, which means you don't have to type slash admin slash for every single route that you've got in the admin system, which saved us a lot of time. And, and it means that if you want to change that, you've got one place to change it, and that's easy. Stacking predicates, um, having multiple views that are all registered to the same name, but will only show under certain conditions. That, that's something that we made quite hefty use of. And custom predicates for checking things like workflow states of objects if you're trying to visit, uh, say, you're trying to fill in your response and your response has been invalidated by the administrator or whatever, it can stop you, it can send you to an invalid page instead. Um, exception views, we used exception views for workflow um, and default views. If you're setting up all of your view callables in classes rather than just a whole long list of function definitions, you can put default views at the top as a decorator on the class, which means you can put predicates on a whole set of views rather than having to do each one individually. It's, it's quite nice. So 
how does this all tie together? I've got a little video for you. This is our, our uh, Joe Public. He's having a little play around with the pretty sliders. See, look, it does work on, a, on an iPhone. It's great. He's having great fun, trying to fill in all his budget. And uh, he's quite happy playing away. And our administrator, he's not so happy. He's just realized that he made a bit of a mistake in the leisure area. He actually marked that as a source of income rather than a place where he's needed to spend money. So he's going to have to change that. So off he goes. He closes the simulator. Whilst our uh, member of the public is just reviewing the effects. You can't read it, but it says that libraries are going to all be closed down. Um, <laughs> we don't want that. So he's going to go back. And um, this is one of the predicate stacking. The budget, the consultation's closed. The workflow state of the consultation is closed. That's fallen back. And meanwhile, our administrator's going through and fixing his little mistake. And our end user's fairly happy. That message there says, you know, hang around for a bit. It'll open. You'll be all right. He's happy. He's changing things. I made this. This took too long. I thought I'd talk for longer about this, and then I ran it back, and I didn't have time to re-record it. So. So he tries to open the simulator. At this point, a workflow exception gets called. And we register an exception view on it to let the administrator know that there are responses in the system. Because if you go and publish your consultation having changed something as important as uh, a source of income to a source of expenditure, you need to make those responses that you've already got invalid because it's changed the entire meaning of the consultation. You can't. You can't accept the responses that have already been put in. So he's going to reopen the simulator and validate all the responses. And our end user gets forwarded to the third level of the, uh, well, the stacking, which is telling him that his response is invalid. He gets instant feedback. He knows now that although all of that work he put in, balancing up his budget, has all been thrown away, you know, the, the council that are asking him for his opinion, care enough to tell him at least, and suggest that he starts again. So that covers um, changing the ACL on the simulator in, in line, um, multiple predicate stacking, uh, workflow errors, all the stuff I was just talking about, which I can't remember what any of it was now. Colander and Deform, I don't really have very much to say about that. They're just really easy, it saves you a lot of hassle. Um, we've got a demographic section, which is now and often one of the things that clients want to change is the set of demographics questions they ask. So the only, the only place where any of that is touched is in the schema for the demographics. So you've got one place to go and edit it. If you want to add a field, you change it there. Everything displayed in the admin system just interrogates the schema uh, to find out what it's supposed to be displaying and in what order. Um, and the storage for the demographics was a very naive. I think it was a persistent mapping uh, in a, an OOB tree. Um, so it doesn't care what it's storing either. Only, only the schema cares what, what's going on, which works quite nicely. Diazo, if you don't use Diazo with Pyramid, you should, I think. Um, it's great. You can build absolutely flat HTML. You don't have to style it at all. And then that gives you effectively an API, which you can just send to anyone. You can say, here you go, do something with that. Um, and then you can, you can have a designer and a front end developer doing their thing completely separately and hook it all up at the end. You can turn it into anything. And you can take any idiot's HTML and do it as well, which is nice. <laughs> and we did. Uh, <coughs> oh, God. Jamie, if you're watching this, I'm sorry. <laughs> He's a nice guy. Um, and you don't have to pollute your app with compromises for, for the sake of theme, because you can, you can work your way around those things with uh, XSL when you want to get really elbow deep in, in Diazo. So to cover off, what did we really like about Pyramid? Pretty much everything. There were a few little glitches along the way, but the Auth and Group Finder stuff's dead easy. Predicates, you can, you can just do anything with them. It's great. They're brilliant. Um, the documentation. Documentation I hadn't talked about. There wasn't any particular place to talk about it, except 
in something that's good about Pyramid, the docs are good. There's generally speaking only one way of doing things that's documented and that way of doing things is documented well unless it's a choice that you want to make like between traversal and dispatch. Maybe there could be a little bit of documentation about combining the two. I don't know. I didn't search for any, actually. <laughs> um, there is. Brilliant. Even better. I shall read it and make sure that we did it right. Uh, <laughs> everything runs in one process. Like If you're doing a plane site with your, your instance and maybe deliverance, and you've got two separate processes, and if you're running that on a ZO as well, although I suppose we'll be breaking that out into a ZO when we go production with it, because we need to be able to get into P-Shell, P -shell, which is... It's been instance debug, and if, if it wasn't for P-Shell, I think Pyramid would would suffer greatly um, just for the sake of, excuse me, being able to get into your storage without having to do it through the front end. You can get in there without having to hack in a PDB statement on a live site. You don't want to have to do that. That's not a safe way of doing things, especially when you forget to delete it afterwards. Um, <laughs> test run fast. There's not a lot of boilerplate. You don't have to do very much to get it working and to, to prototype stuff. So at the start, I was talking about uh, our list of requirements. So we'll go through those and compare. It's got to be pretty. Well, it was also pretty quick to make it pretty in lots of different ways, using less. We managed to put together three demos in three different color schemes in about 10 minutes before the launch, which was Nice and straightforward, there's the first one. It's nice and blue. The second one is a red one with ambulances. This one is like a bee. It's quite nice. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I don't have much to say about it. I'm just showing, you know, you don't have to do very much to make things look pretty. Uh, <laughs> it's got to be, I'm doing pretty well here. I've, I thought this would take longer, so I might slow down. Um, it's got to be responsive. So we haven't written an awful lot of JavaScript. One of the things that we wanted to do was minimize the number of page reloads that had to happen for people to use a site because you don't want people getting bored waiting. Uh, all the calculations are taking place in JavaScript. Um, but there's a lot more that we can do there. We, we just haven't done it yet. Uh, we do have responsive layouts, and they do work. They're being redesigned again. Um, <laughs> and. And they're working all right. They're good. It's, it's great. We've achieved our goal there. Accessibility, well, the color schemes. We've got a nice set of default themes you can choose to make sure that your site's accessible. What we haven't got is an actual accessible site yet. We haven't run an audit on it. We're just, we know that there are some places where it's going to fail, and those need dealing with before we can really sell it to a client. I was about to take a sip of water out of the microphone then. Um, <laughs> translatable. Every single piece of text that you can see anywhere on Budget Simulator is, is I-18 end. You can translate it. Some of the translations won't fit because some of the designs that we got back from our designer are unfortunately a little bit reliant on fixed width. So that needs fixing. Customizable. We, we decided a long time ago that we wouldn't sell renewals to clients. We'd sell them new uh, instances because otherwise they wouldn't get the new stuff. I mean, it would be their choice if they wanted to use the old one. Uh, so for everything, we'll fork. And obviously, I've already shown you how really, really simple it is to, to change a the theme. Or I've told you. I've not really shown you how to do it, have I? Um, <laughs> Testing, we've got Jenkins integration. We don't get told off by our QA guy anymore. We get told off by Jenkins instead, which is preferable because our QA guy can be quite a scary man. Uh, we don't have Selenium more robot framework yet. We just haven't had time, and the front end of the site just wasn't finished in time to start putting that stuff in. But we do have 80% coverage of our whole app. In fact, by the end of uh, the GD Dench milestone, by the end of the work that we've done up until now, nearly 50% of our Python was in tests, which I don't think is a bad thing. So were we agile about it? We were. We did a lot of fast prototyping, which is just a short way of saying we built things and threw them away a lot. Uh, we had a quick populate script so that we were testing against real data, which I think is very important when you're building something. You want to test against realistic stuff. You don't want to test against 
lorem ipsum and one, two, three, four. You don't, you don't want to do that. It's not very useful. Um, we did make all of our initial inf implementations of storage and things as naive as possible. A lot of it turned out not to need anything more complicated. So it's always best to start off with the simplest thing you can do. We took slices. We did services first, and we did the whole admin setup, the display, the storage. All of that got done, and then we moved on to the next thing, which is one of the uh, tenets of, of agile development. And we've already decided to change the design again after our launch event. That's going to be redesigned, so that's about as agile as you get. What went wrong? Protoduction is a new term that we've come up with. This is where your prototype code ends up going into production. And there's certainly some of it that, some of it for valid reasons, some of it was the right code to write and it didn't need changing. Some of it needs revisiting, but you just don't have time to, to take it away. And that comes up, comes up under short-term technical debt, which you've got to be careful not to turn into long-term technical debt. Leaving interns on their own, don't leave interns on their own. Don't let them make decisions about things. It's a bad idea. They're great in terms of they learn a lot and it's really rewarding having them working with you, but don't leave them on their own to do things. Don't let them make decisions about things either. You end up having to throw a lot of stuff away. Meeting fatigue, when you're doing week-long sprints and you're the scrum master, well, if you're just working on it, it's, it's tiring. When you're the scrum master, it's doubly tiring. And when you're having to do a close down and a setup every week and then the same every other week for, for one of the other products, it, it's, you get a bit cranky, as I'm sure anybody who was having to <laughs> suffer me being a scrum master will attest to. Arbitrary deadlines, don't do that to yourself. Set deadlines, but don't make them hard. Or if you have to make them hard, try not to. Try and make sure that your, your feature list is flexible enough to deal with things being dropped. Because you can't, if you're doing fixed features, fixed timeline, then you're not doing Agile. That's, you're, doing a, you're doing a waterfall project. It's not finished yet, that's a problem. We, we had contracted front-end developers who were, had full-time jobs, they were doing it in their spare time. It's, it caused problems because how, when do you find time to speak to them? They can't come into the office and see you because they're at work at their office. That was a problem, we worked around it reasonably well, but we could have taken steps to deal with that a lot sooner, which we didn't. Um, <laughs> Git is great, right? Branching is great. One tree, many branches. Um, but it can cause problems sometimes when you have somebody who maybe has changed the line ending on every single file in a branch, along with doing all the rest of the work they've done. Uh, and rebasing. Rebasing can be really, really painful sometimes, especially if you've got rebase on automatically in your Git config. And repose workflow is really useful. The ZCML side of it isn't quite complete and it, that became a problem for us which has now become a problem for Matt Wilkes over there because he's now the maintainer for it. But you can solve these problems, you know? You just have to solve it yourself. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's it from me. I got told 10 minutes about eight minutes ago so you've probably got time for a few questions if you want. No questions? You have a question. Uh, some of us have been, <laughs> a lot of the stuff that I'd done for Pyramid before was very my first Pyramid app. And looking back at it now, you can tell that it was my first Pyramid app. Um, it is a very easy thing to learn. Some of us had done two or three smallish projects in Pyramid. We'd been doing a lot of our internal management apps in Pyramid because we didn't need something like Plone for it. Uh, that was quite a good testing ground because it didn't need to be quite perfect because it's internal, it doesn't matter if we have to turn it off and fix it for a bit. No more questions? Excellent. Well then, that's me done. Thanks for listening. <laughs>